Welcome to the um, uh, Adelaide Biomed City uh, Research Mini Reviews. Um, I hope we're connected. It um, uh, looks like we are. Um, and today we have two talks as usual. Um, and I don't want to um, uh, drag out the proceedings uh, with, with me. Uh, I'm here to sort of try and make sure we keep on time, ask questions that appear on the chat, and um, also uh, uh, bring, the, bring the discussion to a conclusion. So our first speaker is um, uh, Dr. Katharina Richter, who's going to talk to us about tackling superbugs, new treatments in the pipeline for antibiotic resistant infections. And Katharina, it's all yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I am sharing my screen. And here we go. Great. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to give a presentation today. Today, uh, I'm very excited to talk about uh, what's in my research pipeline. So my, um, I started my research group in 2019. And um, we are part of the surgery department uh, at the University of Adelaide and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And the mission of um, our group is to develop new treatments to fight antibiotic resistant bacteria and bring those treatments from bench to bedside to really have an impact on uh, better healthcare. Now to bridge this gap, I have a great team behind me, a um, couple of students and postdocs and lots of collaborators, um, both in Australia and um, overseas as well, including an industry partner. Um, so together, we have the goal of developing new strategies to treat um, effectively antibiotic resistant bacteria and specifically also biofilms um, and bring them into clinical trials and uh, products for the market, hopefully one day. Um, our second goal is also to improve health literacy of the public so that people better understand um, how, disease, um, how diseases occur and how we can treat them and also like what to, what to do to better prevent disease and um, yeah, get sick, uh, get, not get sick and um, yeah, uh, treat infections. Uh, we do a lot of outreach activities in that regard, but today I will only focus on the research aspect of our work. Now, superbugs are one of the greatest threats to human health. Um, they cause currently about 1.3 million deaths every year around the world. And this is predicted to to increase to 10 million deaths by the year 2050. Um, this is associated with uh, costs for the, the global economy of $100 trillion, and that will also push uh, 28 million people into poverty around the world. So it's a big problem, and one of the reasons why bacteria become resistant to antibiotics is the fact that they live in biofilms. So biofilms are clusters of bacteria. They embed themselves in a, um, in a slime and uh, this slimy matrix uh, acts as a protective layer so that uh, bacteria can um, be better protected from any environmental conditions, um, any kind of um, antibiotics, any immune attacks um, from immune cells, uh, anything that is out there. It is, it is like a fortress and um, that's, uh, that is what, what's making biofilms or bacteria living in biofilms up to 1,000 fold more resistant to, um, to antibiotic treatments compared to single bacteria. Now, the problem uh, with biofilms is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a default mode of bacteria. This is typically how they live because it's a survival advantage. But the big problem for us, of course, is when those biofilms appear in the human body by disease causing bacteria. So in fact, about 80% of infections in the body are caused by biofilms. This includes, for example, uh, cystic fibrosis, um, implant infections, chronic wounds, surgical site infections, also hernia infections. Now, a main pathogen in all those cases is Staphylococcus aureus, which loves to form biofilms wherever you can think of. And uh, therefore it's a really big challenge for us in the, in the clinic. So the treatment options are typically antibiotics, but at some point surgery becomes inevitable. Now after surgery, you typically get long, um, a long treatment with antibiotics 
um, which is not always curing the infection. So um, this all can cause huge healthcare costs. Um, it can contribute to a low quality of life and also contributes to, emer to the emergence and spread of um, multidrug resistance. And therefore new treatments are urgently needed that um, either boost our existing antibiotics or that uh, don't rely on antibiotics at all so that we have new pathways to treat superbugs. Now in my development pipeline is one um, treatment uh, which we called the toxic cocktail, uh, mainly because one of the compounds, um, diethyl diethylcarbamate, here the compound in, uh, in yellow or DDC, um, this is a, um, an old drug um, which used to be, uh, um, it, it has to be used for um, anti-alcoholic uh, treatment. So like for, for people with um, alcoholism uh, problems. Now we use this drug and combine it with copper ions to form this toxic cocktail to give uh, superbugs a deadly hangover. Um, now, over here, you can see a quick example. So um, we've grown um, Staphylococcus aureus biofilms under steady nutrient flow under the microscope, and big fat biofilms formed. Now, when, when this um, nutrient flow was supplemented with the DDC copper, over time, there was a prevention of biofilm formation. So no biofilm grew, which gave us um, a, a really good, uh, well, a happy day basically, because that was the start of um, many exciting um, studies we carried out. Um, we, basically, uh, we basically found out that this particular treatment is highly effective against Staphylococcus aureus, but also against other Staphylococci species, as well as uh, Candida um, fungi. Um, we filed a patent on that particular, um, on that particular treatment. And my PhD student, uh, Laureen Cole, um, she actually developed a thermoresponsive responsive gel because um, so far we only had the DDC copper as, um, as pure drugs in a solution, which is not the way you would apply it in the clinic. So she actually developed a, um, an injectable gel that is liquid at room temperature and solidifies at body tempera, temp temperature so that we can inject this into the body or have it on the surface of the body where it would um, stick around the biofilms and hopefully if, um, effectively kill them. So this is all in the development pipeline. Now we also put this um, DDC copper treatment into mesh materials made by my postdoc uh, Paula Fassal um, for a better treatment of hernia um, repair or like, yeah. So the hernia meshes, um, that are inserted as a um, supportive material um, to fix the hernia. Um, they are frequently um, colonized with bacteria that then form biofilms. So Paula's meshes uh, contain this particular treatment um, so that bacteria don't even attach to those meshes. Now, um, an honor student last year in Germany, um, she used um, a similar approach using meshes, but um, we plasma activated those meshes, changing the, the surface uh, properties of those meshes with the same um, intention to prevent bacterial infection. Now plasma is now leading to another um, topic or another um, treatment in my pipeline. Um, plasma is for example, generated when lightning strikes water. It is the fourth state of matter. And um, so, we're talking about phys physical plasma, right? So it's the fourth state of matter. And um, it comprises of an ionized gas um, with lots of fragmented ions, lots of radicals, lots of different molecules, and it's very high in energy. So we can, we can see plasma, for example, when lightning strikes water, um, but we can also produce it by ourselves. For example, when we microwave grapes or when we use a plasma generator. Now here for this project, um, I'm collaborating with the company Plasma Treat, um, which is a global leader in plasma in code plasma technology. And um, together with the, the company, we plasma activated water. And like this, we try to trap all the energy of, 
of the physical plasma. We try to trap this energy and all the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species and all these radicals. We trap this in water. Now we did this in uh, with a couple of different machines to try to um, understand which machine is the best one with the highest efficacy against biofilms and uh, the lowest toxicity against human cells. And um, we, we did, for example, we carried out a, an artificial um, a wound infection. So we made artificial skin and infected the skin with Staphylococcus aureus. We let the, the bacteria grow biofilms um, over 24 hours. And then we treated the biofilm with plasma activated water. Um, after that, we extracted the bacteria to count colony forming units and determine the efficacy of um, the different water types. And we actually found that one particular water type had a log 10 reduction of 4.83, which is um, equivalent to a biofilm killing of 99.9985%. So this is a really, really great uh, result and uh, gave us lots of hope um, to you know, broaden this application. And together with my postdoc, Adrian, Adrian Apto, we actually carried out multiple um, assays to determine uh, the, the broad spectrum activity of the plasma activated water. So this one is not only working against gold and staph, uh, but also against multiple other superbugs that cause lots of um, infections and lots of problems, not only in humans, but also in animals. And we uh, tested the, um, the uh, toxicity in cell culture, and we found that none of those um, plasma activated water types were toxic. Um, and we actually currently carry out a, um, a first pilot study in, uh, in mice to identify the, um, the in vivo activity, um, like efficacy and safety of the plasma activated water. We see great potential for this particular application, for example, as, an, an, as a new anti, um, antibacterial uh, wound irrigation or like a lavage for chronic wounds, for dentistry, for surgical site infections, um, things like that. But uh, we are not only limited to the human world. Of course, we can broaden the application to different other areas as well. And um, I really love to collaborate. So um, one of my collaborators is, uh, for example, Andrea McWerther. She's a veterinary scientist uh, at the Roseworthy campus. And with her, we, um, we collaborate on using the plasma activated water in the chicken industry um, to decontaminate chicken farms from salm salmonella and also to use it to, um, for example, as an egg wash um, to remove pathogens from egg products or, or chicken meat um, so that uh, we can ensure food safety and um, uh, improve animal welfare. Um, another Treatment in my pipeline is a UV laser device. This is in collaboration with uh, IPAS, so the Institute of Photonics and Advanced Sensing, specifically with uh, Roman Kostecki, Heike Ebend of Heidebrim, and also with the, uh, with the surgeon Markus Troxler. Now, this particular um, laser device, um, as it says, it's, it's built on a laser, and we use a, like a single wavelength of UV light that is not toxic to human cells. We use this one single wavelength of UV light to effectively kill bacteria. And um, it also has great potential to kill even viruses. So this uh, prototype is in the development pipeline. And um, yeah, there is a lot happening. Now, um, to wrap this up, um, again, our mission is to bring new treatments um, to fight antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, from bench to bedside or in general to human or veterinary applications um, to, um, yeah, to bridge this gap. We have a lot of collaborations going on. And um, if people are interested um, to study with us, to uh, do an honors master's or PhD degree, or to col collaborate with us, I'm always um, happy to hear from people. So please get in touch. You can find my details either here or um, I have a public profile as well. So after all, um, our work is of course um, not only done by me, it's um, or by my group. We have many people um, who support us all along the way. So um, thank you very much for everybody um, at the University of Adelaide and all my collaborators in Australia and overseas. Thank you. 
Well, look, thank you very much. It's a, it's a big program and it's obviously doing very, very well. Uh, we don't have any questions on the chat, but I did want to ask you, when you're putting this plasma activated process onto a mesh, how long does that last for? Is that going to last for a few hours or days or years? So um, when we plasma activate the mesh, this is a permanent change because we like we use physics to change the, the properties of the mesh material, right? So the material is completely changed on the surface. The core is still the same, just the surface is different. Um, now, how long it would last once you implanted it into the patient, um, that's a thing we don't know yet because we need to um, study this. We haven't done that yet. Okay, no, no, that's, that's very helpful. Well, you've filled your 15 minutes. Uh, so we will move on and uh, invite uh, Stephen Kidd to talk to us. Stephen's the Senior Lecturer of the School of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Sciences, Engineering and Technology. And he's going to talk to us about diabetic foot infection as a model for relapsing bacterial infections. And I don't think you can get a better model than that. So Stephen, it's all yours. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Let me just um, uh, share my screen. Two, three, one. Yeah. So thank you very, very much to the organisers and to Guy for inviting me along. Um, as Guy said, I'm from the University of Adelaide, from the Department of Molecular and Biomedical Sciences. I'm also within the Australian Centre of Antimicrobial Resistance and Ecology um, at the University of Adelaide as, as well. Uh, and the title of my talk was Diabetic Foot Infection as a Model for Relapsing Bacterial Infections. And, you know, we're interested in a lot of you know, interesting examples of relapsing uh, infections by bacteria. And there's, there's many of these ac across the body, different pathologies, including pulmonary diseases, and in particular, otitis media and osteomyelitis. But the, the big focus of our research at the moment um, are patients with diabetes who have complications with uh, foot, foot ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, that get treated and seemingly uh, this is going successfully, but progresses to a diabetic foot infection. Um, and indeed, uh, once again, despite uh, seemingly successful intervention, this goes on to osteomyelitis. And as Katerina quite rightly put, pointed out, sometimes even though there has been uh, treatment and seemingly this is successful, uh, the, the last option for treatment actually is surgery which in itself is, is not always successful. Um, the bacteria of choice that we look at is also Staphylococcus aureus, golden staph. And like I said, a focus of our research at the moment is diabetic, diabetic foot infections. And, you know, there's two, well, there are different angles in if we're considering chronic and relapsing infections. Um, and, and a big part of this is why antimicrobials fail but in, in and amongst all this there's uh, the diagnostic and treatment regimes that are applied and where there are gaps within that and that might be um, due to uh, host factors um, and and for patients with di diabetes there's a, a big sense of immune dysfunction which allows for reinfection from a new bacteria or new bacterial species um, but in amongst all this, I think the most important thing that's coming to light is that there's a subpopulation of bacteria that remain. Um, and even though there has been um, a cleared uh, host pathology, uh, there's a subpopulation that are tolerant of the, the processes and that these remain. And for patients with diabetes, they, they end up with a diabetic foot ulcer that gets treated. And even without infection, there's antimicrobial uh, agents within there, such as silver. And then there's antibiotics. This progresses on to a diabetic foot infection and antibiotic treatment, uh, which um, then the last option usually is amputation. And <clears throat> despite amputation, somewhere in between, in, in amongst all these, somewhere in between 30 to 55 percent of these cases uh, relapse. Now, in a, um, as, a, as a pure scientist, we look at this and, and I think there's been a real shift in the paradigm as our understanding of these kind of infections and where reinfection comes along. Um, and it, it wasn't too long ago, maybe 15 years ago, that we 
which studied the pure science of an infective agent such as Staphylococcus aureus as a clonal bacterial cell population. And uh, in, not just in terms of the pure science of, of what that exactly means, but also how we study its growth, its growth kinetics, how we design vaccines and drugs, and even new antibiotics is all designed against what would seemingly be a single cell type of that bacterial species. And I guess there's a changing view in how that bacterial population <clears throat> actually exists. And we now understand that there's a heterogeneity of cell types. Um, there are those cells that are predisposed, <clears throat> even in a healthy situation for the bacteria, there are those cells that are predisposed to form biofilms, there are persister cells, and then there are other cells in there that have a very slow metabolic rate and some other distinctive features that are referred to as small colony variants. And, and it's those that are the focus of our research. And when we talk about cell type heterogeneity for bacteria, that's, you know, it, it's kind of a little bit of a new way of understanding a, a bacterial cell population. But what we're looking at is a variation in subtle features uh, which have big changes in the phenotype, and that might be in the transcriptional genetic or epigenetic uh, impact on the cell, the uh, surface proteins, surface structures, the cell fitness, how the, the population responds to stress response, uh, how they survive within a host over a prolonged period of time, and their interaction with a host. And you know, if we were to look at this as a, as a little bit of a working model within a host, we've got a population of bacterial cells in amongst these are the active cells that are producing um, agents and enzymes to resist the, the stresses being generated by host cells or indeed antibiotics. But in a, while doing that concurrently alongside those uh, stress responses, the bacteria are producing agents that are immune mediators and toxins and the like. And so there's a really active interaction between these active cells and its local environment in that host pathogen environment, and that causes a pathology. And in amongst those uh, active cells are these dormant or quasi-dormant cell types, the small colony variants, the SCVs, and other sort of persister cells or viable but non-culturable cell types that exist there. And over time, um, and with a healthy host and good antibiotics, a lot of those active growing cells will, will, will be killed and the host will win the battle, but there can be mutations that result in resistance to the uh, stresses, but also uh, there's this uh, idea of tolerance of the stresses that are being produced. And, and a big problem that has existed for a long time is how we grow these bacteria and characterize them. Uh, there's probably two aspects to tolerance. And you know I'm not gonna go through this in a lot of detail, needless to say that if I depict those mutations as this star here, we get a, a, a a genetic um, mutation of some kind uh, that then changes the population that uh, such that it can now exist with the presence of that stressor. So we're getting a dominant population of these quasi-dormant or dormant cell types. Um, but there's sort of a little bit of a new idea around the tolerance and some of the work we've done is, is in amongst this uh, new field where there's what I've called here as a new tolerance where the active cells are made inactive through a, a range of different genetic um, events such as genetic rearrangements and you've got a population of cells that can now be intracellular or extracellular and then there are other um, uh, genetic events that will then bring these dormant cells back to life and we get uh, now a population of active and sort of quasi-active cells that can go on and cause disease and once again the question is how we grow uh, all these different cell types and characterize them. Uh, for patients with uh, diabetic foot ulcer, um, there are bones or, or diabetic foot ulcer that progresses to a bone infection. There are extracellular cells and, and these are predominantly made up of gold staph aureus and then the staph aureus can get intracellular. And, and as the bacteria infect bone, uh, this, this ends up getting within particular bone cell types such as osteocytes and predominantly that's, that's the small colony variants. So our research questions are around uh, are there universal changes to the bacteria that we can use as diagnostic tools? Do the genetic events uh, that produce uh, tolerance, for instance, tell us something about the 
mechanisms that bacteria have for persistence? And is it possible to define the paradigm uh, or to predict a paradigm for per persistence? And we've broken this into three kind of areas, the clinical, in vitro, and an adaptation um, mimics. Uh, so for the clinical situation, uh, we have great collaborations with uh, Rob Fittrich and Joe Dawson at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, um, where we get samples of patients with a DFU on its own and a DFI and, and bone samples where the DFI has progressed to osteomyelitis. And we're able to get amputated bone as well as um, the diabetic foot ulcers. And we've been really excited to be able to delineate these staph aureus cell types and, and sort of put this together um, and look at the, the different distribution. And stunningly, your DFU is largely made up of the, the normal active cell types. And there's a, a real cell type heterogeneity when we get into the patients that have a DFI and a DFU uh, together with uh, their bone sample. So we can take these staph aureus cell types and analyze them a little bit better in our, our second sort of part of our research focus, which is an in vitro analysis of clinical samples. Um, and we can do this with genetics and we've done some whole genome sequencing using often single patients that have different variants of staph aureus. And we can see that there is a shift as the, the uh, staph aureus in a DFU goes to a DFI. There's a shift in the bacterial metabolism and their cell wall biogenesis pathways. There seems to be a unique um, uh, set of genes that get changed in that. And then we're able to use some of these isolates in cell biology where we've got a collaboration with Gerald Atkins to look at the uh, bacterial interaction with specific bone cell types such as osteocytes. And we can do some bacteriology looking at the growth and the growth kinetics and the genomics, um, transcriptomics and cell physiology and marry that to some nice cell biology with um, osteocytes. And the last little part of what we, we're trying to do is, is mimic uh, in-host bacterial adaptation. And you know, looking at a, a, a range of bacterial cells together in a cell type population, there are obviously going to be some that have got a slow growth rate. And it's the question that I posed early on was, how do we grow and characterize these? And for this, we use a, a chemostat um, to grow bacteria under steady state for continuous culture. And I often get asked why I do this. And th this is a, a really neat uh, technique that has been used since the 1950s. And indeed, um, Jacques Monod, uh, with his work on bacterial physiology uh, and gene expression together with Francis Jacob, uh, actually used continuous culture in all their work in molecular biology and gene expression that they did. And we've, we've used this, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, but we use it over a long period of time, sort of 60 days, and we get a real change in the uh, cell type. And we've been able to identify a global gene regulator that is instrumental in changing the, the cell type of the bacteria, surface structures. Um, and we've done some genetics to look at this. And we show that there's a change in the rate of mutation uh, that's governed by MGRA, a global regulator. And this fits into our model for how the, the paradigm for how persistence works. And just in uh, really quickly as a current research, some other areas that we're doing is trying to identify the bacteria in clinical samples that are tolerant to, to wound treatments and determine what enables them to live uh, despite these stresses and how we can stop that. We've got a good collaboration with people at the University of Adelaide that produce silver nanoparticles that have been uh, really successful in getting rid of our small colony variants. And I think that's used up all my time. I'd like to acknowledge the PhD students that have worked on this in my lab in the last little while and the people I've collaborated with that I mentioned through the talk as well. So thank you very much. Well, look, thank you very much, Stephen. That, it is really interesting work. Um, again, there are no questions on the chat line, but I just have a couple of sort of quick things. We, we've almost used all your time, but you talked about the concept of cell fitness. What is cell fitness? What does that actually mean? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a really interesting question, Guy. They've, um, depending on who you talk to, would be uh, you get a different answer. So the bacteria's ability or the bacterial ability to continue to grow in a stressful environment, you know, and for some, uh, for a host pathogen environment uh, without any pathology, uh, that might just be a, a slower growth rate where they're not producing certain 
uh, metabolic features, uh, but they're able to continue to grow for a long period of time. You know, if you're talking about something like antibiotic treatments or, or other kind of during a disease or abscess formation or something like that, the fitness uh, has other molecular features in, in around it, but yeah, yeah. So it's a slightly different answer depending on the context, but yeah. And, and one other very quick question. We all know osteomyelitis is awful. It's so hard to treat and get a result. Can, can you, are you able to, do you understand or do we understand why bone infection is more challenging to manage? Is it simply the blood supplies different and, and, and not as good as soft tissue? Or is there something about the osteocyte that's different that we haven't really understood? Yeah, and, and you've asked those questions in, in a really, really great way because they're, they're kind of host factors. And I think some answers would be exactly those things. The, the way I kind of look at it, um, and we've got some research around this, is we've got small colony variants that would transit from some, some so, so, uh, skin and soft tissue infection, for instance, and some of these bacteria are able to get intracellular. Uh, and some of the bacteria will go, will not be intracellular, will be extracellular, there might be interaction, and they're the ones that are causing the disease. Uh, so when we cut away, when there's amputation or, or treatment of osteomyelitis, for instance, it's getting rid of those active cells, but you know, just next door to those sitting within the healthy bone uh, are still the bacteria with an ability to revert to the, to the active state. Uh, and, and that can be in weeks or months later. Um, and they sit there as a reservoir, um, yeah, in a, in a dormant state. So that, that's the kind of a little bit in 25 words or less. Hopefully I haven't overextended. I could talk for a lot longer. No, no, don't. No, don't, don't, yeah, don't. Yeah, but I think that, so there are host factors and, and um, yeah, and I don't, yeah. And I, those are really interesting and I, I could talk about those, but yeah. I think uh, in terms of the small colony variants and their, their role um, from a bacterial point of view, I think that would be a, a legitimate answer. And we've got some neat research that seems to you know, back that up too. Well, look, both of you, thank you so much. Uh, Katarina, wonderful stuff and great, great slides. Loved your slides. Um, Stephen, very interesting work. And, and you've certainly got yourself some fantastic collaborators. So thank you very much. We'll be returning again next Tuesday for another session. And uh, for those who have participated, thank you so much for dropping by. Thanks a lot.